It says that you did professional gaming? Yeah. I was one of the um one of the original people old uh back in the day that played video games for a living. And so uh back in the nineties, way way back in the nineties, kids. Um we had, there was a, a comp little company out of Boulder, Colorado. Most of the game companies back then were in Southern California. There wasn't even really that many overseas that did anything. And uh, they had, I won a tournament, a computer pinball tournament for a little company. The, the, pub, the, the developer was out of Tokyo named Little Wing, and they're still out there. And the publisher was out of Boulder, Colorado. They were transplants of California. Uh, and the company was named Starplay. And they called me up and, and they, they, I won the tournament and for a pri one of the prizes was to have me test their brand new game, which was called Looney Labyrinth, which is a pin, another pinball game. And I hated it. I wrote this scathing review. It's like, oh my God. Cause I was a, I was a really good pinball player in real, you know, real life stuff. And I said, oh, there's so many things wrong with this. And the, the big thing was it was too easy. You could get too many extra balls. And basically, if you were even a half-decent pinball player, you'd basically just collapse from exhaustion because yeah. the game would never end. And they liked my review so much, they said, uh, um, why don't you come out and interview for, uh, for a job? And so I flew out during a snowstorm and interviewed with them and... I uh, got to, it was, it was a blast. It was the best two, three years of my life as far as uh, software goes. Because I get to travel around um, to, you know, the early conferences, you know, Macworld Boston and Macworld San Francisco and E3 and stuff like that and, and, um, and make, play games and talk to all the game, gamer guys and, and uh, rub elbows with gamers that would be famous later, you know, game, game companies basically that would be famous later. And it was, it was so much fun. And then, uh, you know, like all small publishing companies, you either get absorbed or you eventually die. And we, they finally closed shop and that was it. And then I went on to teach proprietary software for the better part of 20 years out in Colorado. Yeah. So what exactly does that mean, teaching proprietary software? Is that like... Um... So like, for example, there's a lot of software packages out there that people have never heard of. And so they're proprietary. They're not, they're not publicly traded. Uh, they're very unique packages. Like um, in this case, time, time and attendance software is what I did. So this would be time tracking software, not time travel or anything weird like that. It yeah, was, like clocking in at work. Exactly. That's exactly what it is. And it is very, very customizable. So it's a very broad package because your rules for overtime and rounding and vacation pay and sick pay and all that. It varies from state to state and even county to county. So you had to make these custom software packages and tweaks for all these companies and make special interfaces for them and charge ridiculous amounts of money for some of these packages. You know, we're talking about time timekeeping software and we were charging 20, 50, 80 grand for, for, oh, these, yeah. pa for these packages. And, but you have to train people on it. So for a number of years, I traveled around the United States and some outside the United States into blue collar uh, companies because that, you know, time keeping is mostly for, you know, factory people. And I would teach the, these blue collar workers how to run the software. And that's what uh, it, you, you learned how to not necessarily dumb things down, but remove the stuff that they wouldn't use to give them, it's like, okay, here are the exact basics you need to use to run this software. You don't need any of these other features, like anything. I mean, there's lots of stuff in, in everything. You know, like there's most of the settings on your television you're not gonna use and your sound system and your computer even. You're not gonna use all this stuff. You're just gonna use this. And so I, I, I got really good at boiling down things into the, the basic components. And that's what I did. And got to travel into just about every town in the country that you'd never ever even you never even knew existed or you would never ever go into on vacation so you'd fly into a big airport and then maybe fly to a smaller airport from that big airport and then get a rental car and drive another 30 45 minutes to some town in the middle of nowhere and hope they had a chinese buffet because i was a that was one of my weaknesses so yeah so i did yeah um i do have to say working on the commercial end I also used to work uh, 
basically directly for companies. Hmm. It's so good just because companies will really, uh, they'll pay you just about anything if you do the job well. They, they will. The, our problem was, because I had to do support on the other end. So when I wasn't traveling, I was doing um, software support for this package. And payroll software is mission critical. You know, if your payroll package goes down on payroll day and you've got 300 people lined up in tank tops <laughs> waiting, oh, yeah. for, waiting for their paycheck, oh, you freak out. And people would call and, uh, and and just lose it. I mean, I had people crying, people threatening, people yelling. You know, I even had like a fixer call me up once. You better fix this package or we'll be coming for you. It's like, what? You know, come on. Um, so it was, yeah, they would pay anything though, you know, to have this. I mean, to any because time tr timekeeping software was basically to keep the employees from ripping you off even though technically you ripped them off first because you were paying them such a crappy wage to begin with. So, you know, it, that's how that's how people in, in blue collar got around things. They would figure out a way to work the system. And so the timekeeping so software was meant to turn the balance in, in the company's favor. So it was this weird game that we would play. And I mean, hell, I mean, I, I helped even put people in jail that would like rip off the system. And they weren't even um, the, the factory workers. They were the administrators. Ugh. Terrible. Yeah. yeah. So if I'm getting this right, after proprietary software, what you would do is you would try to debunk these conspiracy uh, conspiracy theories. When um, you got to flat well, Earth. That was during another company. So after proprietary software, well, no, I was still doing. Then I was doing internet research for uh, a staffing company of all things. They had a really unique business model. I've had some interesting companies to work for. And while I was doing that, the, here's, here's the big thing. The big thing was during all that, because I was doing a lot of business travel or I just wasn't, my social situation was just chaotic that I never married or had kids. And if you don't ever get married or have kids, you have a lot of free time on your hands. <laughs> Tons of free time. You don't understand it. People, because most people get married. You know, by the time you're hitting, you know, pushing 30, most, most people are already married. Um, I know it's a little different now, but for a lot of my friends, you know, that they were married, you know, in their mid twenties. Right. And so I absorbed a huge amount of media. So not only did I watch a lot of TV and go to the movie theater every weekend, uh, that I could, as long as there was a decent movie out there, I went every weekend and sometimes I'd even go Saturday and Sunday, um, and I didn't, because I didn't want to wait for my friends, you know, because they were married or doing or whatever. It's like, screw it. I'm going, I'll go watch a movie by myself. I don't care. Um, and then playing a lot of games because I was still, you know, a lifelong gamer. Uh, between all those things, the other thing that kind of surfaced was when YouTube came out. Because YouTube has a lot of conspiracies on it. It took a while for them to, to get forward. I mean, you, there used to be dedicated websites, especially like after 9-11. But YouTube really just amped, amped things up. And so I, I watched, you know, again, absorbed a lot of it. It's like, yeah, you know, 9-11, that's pretty interesting. Um, Bigfoot uh, having Elvis's baby, probably not as much. <laughs> not, not, Wait, not, is, that a, is that a real conspiracy? Theory? No, I don't think it actually is, but it wouldn't okay. surprise me if it was. Yeah, that's what, that's why I had to ask. Well, I, I'm mixing. It's like you know the Bigfoot thing. I'm from the Northwest, and so is there is it possible yeah. there's a primate running around that nobody's ever seen? Yeah, possible. Um, is Elvis still alive? There's that. I mean, that's a thing too. Some people say oh, Elvis never died, and right. but apparently in the conspiracy world, nobody ever dies. Yeah, exactly. There's always somebody that's still kicking around, that's pretending to be somebody else. It's like, come on, people die, or people are killed. Um, but that's when I got into, that's when I got into this. I mean, I'd looked at just about every conspiracy you could think of and still refused to look at Flat Earth. Hated it. It's like, ugh, don't want to look at it. Cause everyone knows it's the stupidest conspiracy ever. And it's not even a conspiracy. It's that stupid, right? That's, that's the logic. And then I looked at it and I thought, okay, I will bring my skills to bear and shut this thing down and move on and put it in the Elvis Presley classification. It didn't happen. In fact, it was the exact opposite. I could not resolve it. Could not yeah, get an stuck. answer that was that was good enough for me. So finally, um, that's when I made a series of videos at the beginning of 2015 and said, okay, I'm going to go the other way. I'm going to make a series of videos and I'm just going to keep putting them out there until somebody answers that can shut, that can convince me 
It's like, look, I can't, I can't prove the globe in a court of law anymore. Can't do it. Now, can again, can I go the other way, you know, with flat earth and prove a flat earth? No, but I can, I can shoot more holes in the globe now than I can a flat earth by a long, by a huge margin. And that's where everything just started falling to pieces because people started coming to me from different professions stating, you know, like Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, uh, pilots, air traffic controllers, um, engineers, those, those type of people. And they all kept saying the same thing. It's like, yeah, you know what? It's not nuts. Here's why. They, you know, saying you, you may be on to something. It's like, and that's not what I wanted to hear. <laughs> it's like, what? No. No, tell me, please let it end. And they, they, they were the ones that really were, they put the final convincing on me where, you know, the first six months, I think of 2015, I was going, okay, maybe someone's going to come back with something. And instead it just kept getting reinforced and reinforced until finally uh, I was all in. And I had heard, because I had answered so many of my own questions in the first nine months and everybody else filled in the blanks for me and came right. up with those things. And, and now it's just... You know, as you know, it's just gotten huge at this point. Yeah. I lost lost count of the interviews, you know, the documentary, the commercial, a um, couple books, all this stuff. And I didn't have to even lift a finger. It just kept happening on its own. And I'm, I'm a big believer in fate. So it's like, okay, whatever's happening now is for a reason. And um, and it just keep, seems, things see, keep seeming to, to fall in line without really any much effort on on our part i mean yeah we've had some people do some amazing things but as a whole we've almost gotten no resistance yeah so, so speaking on that when you say uh, you're a strong believer in faith is that like a is that like a spiritual thing or just is is it actually like religious uh you know it's it's interesting because and i i said this in the clues i was uh, I was raised a born again Christian, you know, went to vacation Bible school and Camp Malibu and, you know, church was not just a Sunday thing, you know, in, grew up kind of in the 80s and, and early 90s when um, uh, the island that I, that I grew up on, it was very, very strong. But then, but it was a very sheltered rural environment. And so when I went off to university, I actually found out there was more than one religion, go figure, and that there was this big world out there that I didn't even know of. I was very naive. And so I fell away. I didn't didn't go to church. Why would I? I mean, there's all these new things to learn. And um, so I, it was still in the back of my mind. And then I got into tech, and which you know is not necessarily anti-church, but it's really heavy science, science fiction. Which you know, there's no room for religion in that, unless you're talking about the Force. But that's a whole other thing. And then when I got into flat Earth. Uh, it changed everything. And I've heard this from a lot of people, at least half our membership, uh, I say membership like it's a formal thing, at least half of our members mm -hmm. are diehard Christians, at least in the United States and, and yeah. in parts of Canada. And what they all said was, it, it, the same thing applied to me. It, it was, it brought me back to spirituality. Now, do I go to church with the same sort of level, you know, that I had before? No, in fact, I still really haven't gone back to church. But I have so so much more of a respect. I've got a deeper respect for the whole side of spirituality, to where I can't even condemn any of the any of the five major religious houses of the world, um, because they I think they've all got pieces of the same puzzle. And but does it do, do I believe in a creator uh, now more than ever? Yes, because if it is you know a building, if it's a structure then it was built by someone and it's you either it's either an advanced civilization that's older than ourselves or a deity and at that point you're really just splitting hairs because one man's golden spaceship is another man's god right hmm. um so you mentioned before you got into the flat earth conspiracy yeah uh, you didn't really like it uh did you ever kind of wonder like why does it matter if the earth is flat or what how does how does it change? I, I did. As, as Mar you, no, that's an excellent question. And uh, many people have asked me that. It's like, why does it matter? You know, <laughs> I mean, the, the, the longer version is, it's like, my wife hates me. My kids don't listen to me. My job sucks. I still got to go to it in the morning. Why do I care? And I tried to tell them, it's like, well, you won't care unless you believe it. And if you believe it, all of a sudden everything changes because it changes the universe from this little rock 
flying through space that means nothing and you're an accident with no purpose to a building that was built for you, exactly for you. And even though I can't tell you exactly what your purpose is, you have a purpose, you have meaning. And that's a powerful thing to put out to any civilization. So, and it's part of the, like the three pronged problem of releasing this to the public. So in, let's say the, the powers that be didn't figure this thing out till like 1960. Do you tell the public? Probably not. Not then. You don't. Uh, academically, every university in every state in every country would have to be rebuilt. The physical foundations of all science, physical sciences, archaeology, biology, geology, take your pick. They all have to be rebuilt. Libraries would have to be cleared out and restocked. It would take years. That's academic chaos. Then you have uh, the world markets. World markets have to be suspended for months just to figure out what it means. I mean, look what the frickin' virus has done in just a couple weeks to the markets. It's it's utter nuts out there. And that's just a that's just a virus. Uh, and then, of course, the spirituality thing, you know, the, the five major religious houses that I was talking about, you're, you're telling the, the five big houses of the world, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, Islam, and Christianity, to that the, they now have leverage against science, who's been beating them over the head with textbooks for the last five centuries. You're, you're telling them to show restraint. So, so it's not, it, it, I, I like to rephrase it for people because they say, who, who benefits, who, who gets the advantage if, if it's a, if it's a flat world, I go, it's, it's not who benefits it, who, who has something to lose? Because if you don't, if you don't know until 1960, for sure that that's what it looks like, you've already built your civilization. The infrastructure is already there. Everything's already been built. It's what could be torn down. So you have, you basically could lose a lot and you're not going to take that risk. Nobody would. I wouldn't. I, I'd be like, nope, 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 not, not a chance. I would hold on to this um, until you had a way of uh, putting it out to the public in which yeah. they you could control the narrative. And yeah. that is something I think we we're, that's what we're into now. I mean, look, look, the infrastructures that we have built now is ready for it. High speed Internet, social media, six billion smartphones. I mean, more people have smartphones than they have running water. And now you could push that narrative out if you want. I mean, again, I, I, I didn't create Flat Earth. None of my friends created Flat Earth. In fact, we're doing, seemingly doing the legwork for whoever's out there. We're, we're running basically unopposed, which is just mind-blowing to me. I mean, why the three major faces of science, the, th the three social media scientists have not come out against us directly, it's staggering. Yeah, you mentioned that you know, there's a lot of reasons you wouldn't want to put it out there that the Earth is flat to the public right now. Right. Uh, but then I would question, why in the first place did they tell us it was a globe? Um, I talked about this in the clues a little bit, which is, if you don't turn this world into a globe, at least metaphorically or at least change the perception, change the perception into a globe, you run the risk of people finding out too early meaning civilization is only it, it, the only thing that slows it down is the level of its technology so and you remember the like the car the internal combustion engine which runs everything uh we've only had that for 100 years give or take and what happens so if you do not tell people that the world is a globe what happens is the old legends the old myths because again you can look up ancient cosmologies and they all drew the same thing they drew this snow globe that eventually people are going to start thinking wow when we get our stuff up and running when we get stuff better than ships and horses we're going we're going to look we're going to look for ourselves and so event you, you've got to introduce this quickly and because people only think about the boundaries and it was something i i, I talked about in, in one of the videos where I, I likened it to a um a wildlife preserve so in a wildlife preserve you know you take you know, let's say it's a thousand acres give or take you put some buffaloes in there stream some grass trees they're happy they're nothing you put any animal in there they are going to be just you give them enough room they're great doesn't matter if there's a fence there or not they don't care they're not even gonna go near the fence like 
I'm going out there. It's going to be fun. You put a dozen people in that same wildlife reserve. All they're going to care about is that freaking edge. They're going to care about the fence. Who built the fence? Why are we on this side of the fence? What's on the other side of the fence? Did we anger the fence makers? Maybe we should sacrifice something to the gods of the fence. Grab the buffalo. And that's that's how it goes. I mean, welcome to religion and, and how things start. And so that's that's why you do it. You, you've got to, the only way to do it is to, to get rid of it. The fence is tell people there is no fence and make sure the fence is so far out there and filled with so much negative reinforcement that anyone heading towards it turns around on their own behalf. You know, you don't guard it. That's the last thing you'd want to do with with big old frost giants with giant axes saying, do you know, you shall not pass. You know, that would right. be the worst thing ever because people all they care about is the freaking frost giants. So you just you know, do a lot of ice and snow and no animal life and no plant life and, and that's it. People turn back on their own and everything's great. I mean, the design, it's very, very clever. I mean, that was the thing for me. It was kept staring at this thing going, all right, how would I build it? And how would I keep the population from knowing it as long as possible? But sooner or later, the technology reaches a level that they're going to detect it. Sooner or later, 5,000 years, 6,000 years, doesn't make any difference. You're gonna, you won't be able to hide it forever. It's kind of like um, hiding cigarettes from your roommate. You can move around here and there. You can get clever. One of these days, they're going to find them. And then you hope they don't smoke. Yeah. So you do you do believe that there is an ice wall around us, uh, which would be like the Antarctic? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's not... When people say the ice wall, it's, it's too simplistic when you say it like that. Because Game of Thrones did us no favors. Uh, because that's what everyone thinks of. It's like, oh my god, it's the giant ice wall from Game of Thrones. It's like, no, when you get to the Antarctic, uh, even before you get to the beach, you know, it's it's icebergs all the way around. I mean, it's it's horrible. It's really, really bad. Ship people don't like going there. And then when you can get to the beach, if, I mean, most of the, the beachhead, the coastline of Antarctica is ice, you know, 150 feet up, right? And if you can get on top of it, that's when it starts getting really interesting because if the whole thing starts plateauing up really, really high, it supposedly plateaus at around 7,000 feet. And that's, that's amazing. I mean, it's the most unique continent, even by mainstream standards is very, very unique. I mean, altitude kick, sickness kicks in at, at what, 4,000, not even 7,000 feet as far as I know. And, um, wait, am I thinking the wrong thing? No, 14,000 feet. 14,000 feet. I'm sorry. It was a, it's even, I, I screwed up my facts there. No, it plateaus at 14,000 feet, which is ridiculous. Altitude sickness kicks in at seven. And uh, so at that point, you're, you're not talking about an ice wall. You're talking about an ice continent. So, and then what we're saying there is the barrier that when you, if you, when you actually get to the actual boundary of this thing, it's probably another thousand miles inland. Because the United States Navy was flying around there for the better part of 30 years looking for it from the 20s all the way up until the 50s. And that's when I think they found it. They found it right, you know, during Operation Deep Freeze, 1955-56. And that's when they closed it down. They started writing up the Antarctic Treaty and that's it. The Antarctic Treaty is bulletproof. It's the un only unbroken treaty in the history of treaties. It's not even a secret. You, if you're a country and you have a corporation and you want to set up shop there, you can't forever. Mm -hmm. No, no reason given. And it's like, right. well, now they can say environmentalism, but it's like, pff, what were you saying in 1959? Environmentalism wasn't even a word back in 1959. Right. And so what's your, what's your idea about what might be behind that ice continent? Uh, I like to think that, um, Sorry, people keep messaging me. The um, I'd like to think that it is a unlimited universe. Maybe more versions of this. Because remember, we're talking about a fairly small place. If there is no space, if there is no giant universe, then you could have dozens of these damn things if you wanted to. Or other continents or more lands. Um, what I like to tell people is, look, try because I'm a big believer in dualism. That, you know, you can't appreciate something without its opposite, you know, hot without cold, pain without pleasure, so on and so on. Uh, and this world appears to be made out of 99% conflict. 
I mean, it's amazingly, it, it's something that people miss, but we've, we've, I, everyone kind of gets it. It doesn't matter how rich, how powerful, how beautiful, how talented you are. Everybody complains about something <laughs> and they've got, you know, it's, which is amazing. You'd think, you know, like when you're a rock star, all rock stars want to be is athletes. Most people don't know that. And all the athletes want to be rock stars. You'd think you'd be happy with one of those two. You know, people that have mansions complain about the servants. Um, people that have amazing looks, you know, model, all they care about is, you know, making sure they maintain it. When, and they can't because of entropy. You know, we, we get older. Um, so if this world is 99% conflict and it's almost inescapable as far as I can tell, I, I, even if you're a bunk, uh, a bunk, a monk chanting in the Himalayan mountains, you know, doing that, you know, the whole thing and trying to g grasp serenity, you're still going to die. You know, monks don't live a thousand years and if they did, they still die. Um, then whatever's outside of this world has to be 99% unlimited. So, because I think that's one of the reasons why we're here. I think we're here to appreciate what's on the other side because you can't do one without the other. Um, we've seen it time and time again, you know, trust fund children are always a mess. You know, if, if, if you, if you give someone too much conflict when they're young, they end up, you know, being traumatized and they can't function as adult. You pamper them too much and they don't, their motivation flags and it goes on and on. So yeah, outside this world, I think unlimited universe. Um, have you, have you heard about the conspiracies that go into finding these giant human bones underground? Oh, like sure. giant bones, like giant. Yeah, yeah, I've heard of them. <laughs> and again, I'd like to say it's, I mean, it's not one of my favorites, obviously, but I have a certain opinion about, but I'm not going to shoot it down. No, not, not by a long shot, because there's certain anomalies that happen out there, which we can't explain. Um, one of the big ones is I throw people, um, you know, the, the Loch Ness monster, for example, I say, you know, we're, we're, they call it a monster, but we're really just talking about a plesiosaur, you know, from, from the, the, the Jurassic era. It's like, okay, are there dinosaurs f swimming around Loch Ness? And you say, no, and I say, why not? It's like, well, they were obviously extinct at least 70 million years ago, or at least a hundred million years ago or more. And I say, okay, fine. Take a look at this fish. It's called a coelacanth. Anyone can look it up and it's spelled C-O-E-L-A-N-C-A-N-T-H, coelacanth. Found the fossil records, really unattractive fish, extinct 70 million years. Every scientist in the world, every scientist in the world, sorry, people keep messaging me. Yeah, uh, you're good. That's right. Uh... Yes. What I was, uh, no, wait, 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 wait. I got, I got to get this out. So 70 million years, they're, they're extinct. Yeah. And yet every scientist in the world would have bet the freaking farm that this thing was, was dead for at least 70 million years. And then they caught one off of South Africa and the British military. And then the, um, another one off of Mozambique, then Madagascar. And it turns out outside of Africa, they're all over the place. Right. So how did science screw up that badly? And what's more important is, hadn't they caught it, had that fish been more elusive, science would still be ridiculing it, even now. It was like, you know, if a fisherman said, oh, I caught one of those rod and reel just last week, science would be laughing at him, it's, oh, it's a drunk fisherman with a fishtail. It's like, no, it wasn't. It absolutely was, was real. And so now I come back and I say, tell me again how there are no dinosaurs swimming around Loch Ness. Because you can't, you can't use the, no, because they've been extinct for a really long time. Um... The, the billy ape that was found, what, five years ago? Uh, a chimpanzee, six feet tall, which is really shy around people, thank God, because we probably would have wiped it out by now. You know, chimpanzee, six feet tall. In fact, they, they still can't get a catch a live one. I mean, they're, they're too damn agile. So when you say, oh, you know, there's no primates living around in other forests because we haven't caught any, it's like, uh, we didn't, we didn't even know the Billy Ape was a thing. I mean, um, not to delve too much into like cryptozoology, but look at, I mean, everything, everything we had at one point was a myth because science like, well, I haven't seen it. Therefore it's a unicorn. The giant panda was a total, was a myth. The giant anaconda was a myth. Um, and one of my favorites, the freaking giant squid, which still has never been the only reason we even knew they existed is because when they would do um fights with sperm whales the only things that can kill them apparently um they would leave sucker marks on the side of these things the size of garbage can lids 
and we can't catch one. Not not a big one. I mean, yeah, a small one will die, you know, wash up on some shore. But the big ones we cannot catch. Our best subs cannot catch. I mean, I suppose we could nuke one, but you're not going to catch it. They they dive deeper than our subs. They're faster than anything out there. Uh, you don't ever want to send divers. You know, you're never going to get a diver down that far anyway. So, you know, but scientists will, will at least admit they exist because they found pieces of them somewhere else. That's the part of that science that drives me nuts, which is science is only right until the day that it isn't. And when they're proved wrong, if it's if it's concrete enough, they just envelop it into science. It's like, well, it's ours now. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> you were fighting this like the coelacanth fish. You know, they, they, you know, they didn't know what to do. Did not know what to do. It took them years to finally acknowledge it. And then they find, well, it's it's a it's a living fossil. <laughs> and it's in an evolutionary state of stasis, which means it's not evolving. But it might one day. It's like, you're just making this shit up. It's, it's like, oh, right. so unsatisfying. I'm sorry. I ramble. Oh, you're good. You're good. I was just saying that with the bones, uh, yeah. let's say these are giant human bones. What if this is a sort of attack on Titan situation where there's giants behind the wall? Do you think oh, that's oh, wouldn't, plausible? Wouldn't surprise me. Why Why? Why would I shoot that down? How? In fact, I, I will not ever be a hypocrite. That's one thing that Flat Earth changed for me. Um, beforehand, and, and I said this literally in the beginning of my very first clue, where I had friends that would probably like your friend, right? Um, that swear to you that the entire royal family of England are made up of lizard people, right? Yeah. <laughs> swear to you this. And I will come at them and go, huh, that's interesting. What about Flat Earth? And go, get the hell out of here. It's like, what? <laughs> he was, what happened to the lizard people? Well, right. So lizard people, that's fine. But my thing is 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 nuts. And mm -hmm. I have we have gotten that resistance in a lot of the conspiracy world, especially with like the 9-11 people. The 9-11 people consider 9-11 the top of the, the heap when it comes to conspiracy because it was so big and so public. And it's like, there's nothing bigger than that. I go, really? Here's Flat Earth. And they're going, sorry, we're not going to acknowledge it because it makes 9-11 just seem tiny, literally tiny by comparison. So no, the the, the bones, why, why the hell, why the hell not? Do, you know, is it one of my favorites? No, but I'm not going to shoot it down. And yeah. so, so let's, let's put it this way. If, if all of a sudden I see a giant walking around somewhere, I will not be shocked in the slightest. I'll be like, oh yeah, yeah, I was wondering where the, where those guys were. Now, will they have huge beards and look like Vikings? Who knows? Uh, right. But, but no, why, why not? I mean, we, we find species all the time. You know, one of my favorite species, in fact, here's, here's, here's a case for the giants would be um, a story I heard. You could look this up. Um, I called it the um, uh, the Goliath Cobra. I'm a big believer in cryptozoology species that when they are found, <laughs> they're found by a really small group of people. <laughs> and then they realize it's like, oh no, <laughs> what if we don't survive to tell anybody that this thing exists? And so like there was this, um, I, I can't remember where it was exactly, but there was a story, and I believe it, um, of a cobra it was just massive, just huge, uh, to where the, the head was basically the size of a, a horse head. And uh, this helicopter was circling over it. And they just, you know, an American helicopter, I think, was circling over this thing. And, and they couldn't believe what they were seeing. And this thing was close enough. They, they were saying it was, an am it was amazingly fast on top of it. It was like a real, basically, it wasn't like a slow, like an anaconda thing. It was basically a cobra that was 30 freaking feet long. And it's like, okay, what happens if you're with a group of five people, you find this thing, you know, <laughs> do you think it's that yeah. easy? Do you think it's like everything else? Oh, take some pictures. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, unless yeah, someone's on, quick on the trigger. <laughs> you're, you're on all the, there. Uh, so on the topic of archeology span yeah. and uh, these bones underground under the flat earth model, right? Yeah. What exactly is underneath the ground and how long does it last? Dun, dun, dun. Directly under the ground or how deep can we dig? That that sort of question? Basically, basically, how deep can we dig? Oh, well, is it, like that, that's just it. And I, love, I got this question at the, at the conference last year, which was, you know, how deep is flat earth? And I'm going, I don't know, because even science doesn't know how deep the, its own earth is. It's like, no, no, they, they know it's 4,000 miles to the center of the earth. I go, oh, really? I go, what's the deepest hole ever dug? And you'd think it's really, it surprises most people. You know, I say, is it half that? Is it 2,000 miles? Is it 1,000? Is it even 100? Uh, no, it's not even 10. It's eight. Eight miles. 
That's it. That's the deepest hole ever drilled with a, with a boring machine. You know, we're not even talking, you know, tunnels. We're talking, you know, a boring machine that's what, maybe a foot wide, two feet tops. Um, the Russians and the Germans tried for years to get past eight miles, which is 12 kilometers. And they couldn't do it, could not do it. And so if you can't drill past eight miles, and we're, I'm not talking about the military, you know, it's like, can the military do, dig deeper? Who knows? Maybe they can, but they're not telling anybody about it. Um, if you can't dig past an eight mile faster or past eight miles, then what exactly are all those diagrams you're showing us of earth? And didn't you think it was kind of funny that all those diagrams were perfectly segmented? These 1000 mile segments of red and orange and yellow and white, and like perfectly balanced. No, no weird strata formations. It was all these perfect layers. It's like, really? And so you have no idea what's down there. And, and you look in the fine print and yeah, that's exactly what science says. It's like, yeah, we have no idea. We, you know, we're just, we're just basing this off of what comes up from lava. That's it. It's like, so why, why don't you just use the, the diagram and put a big question mark in it? Because that science doesn't do that. They, they don't like doing that. They, they used to say, this is our best guess. But now they say, this is what it is until it's proven otherwise. And then we'll claim that's what it is. Which again, it's a statement that, that like Neil deGrasse Tyson, the world's most popular scientist drives me nuts when he says it, he goes, science is right, whether or not you believe in it. And it's like, what? It's like, no, <laughs> no. If, if I can, if I can test the boiling temperature of water at sea level. Yeah, sure. But you can't tell me what the core of the earth looks like, you know, and, 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 and preach it like that because then all of a sudden, you know, kids, people going into grad school think, oh yeah, that's what the core of the earth looks like. It's like, nobody knows what the coral of the earth looks like so yeah when they come back and say what you know how deep is the, the flat earth it's like i don't know i mean we couldn't even even if we wanted to we can go couldn't go past eight miles does it have to be really really thick no in fact if you had subterranean civilizations down there they could live in a in a place that's very small narrow band because most of our civilization lives between sea level and one mile up so even if you had a cavern that was I don't know, five, 10 miles high tops. And I know you're saying, well, it's only eight miles. You can't do 10 miles. But I'm just saying that like even commercial airliners only make it to 10 miles. So, I mean, who's to say we're not inside a much bigger cave at this point? Yeah, it just seems very odd to me, right? Because like under flat earth, the same logic applies where you drop something and it falls. You know, things you don't realize that the flat earth is real and then everything changes and things start floating. So I would assume that like there probably is something very solid underneath the ground. Oh yeah, right? there are, there are very few things in the globe world, with the exception of astrophysics. You know that being aside, but the physical structure that are that much more radical when it comes to flat Earth. Um, gravity, for example, which I love bringing up to people because you know even science, it's one of those little things people don't know that sci you go to a scientist and you say, tell me what, exactly what gravity is. Then they will come back at you and they will say, we can't tell you what gravity is. We can tell you what it does, but we can't right. tell you any more than that. We can only tell you the symptoms of gravity, you know, why things, you know, fall, uh, you know, well, they, they say it's a, a magical molecular force that pulls things down to the center of a ball. And I say, well, it's a mag magical molecular force force that just pulls things um, straight down. And that's, and, and the rest of it also would be density or buoyancy. And that is, it's also, it's not just gravity that's, that's forcing things down. It's also um, a pressurized system. And people, again, there's so much we don't teach. And I know we're just trying to get people through the education system and try to, you know, be a good civilization and empire. But we teach so very little about physics and engineering and chemistry. And most people don't even know. It's like, look, you're living, you're breathing in something. And it's a lot of something you don't even know, which is, you know, it's 80%. It's you're breathing mostly nitrogen, which does nothing. And then less than 20% oxygen. And it's probably pressurized because it's the only way that our atmosphere can even stay here. That, that's a whole other thing, which is like physics, um, gravity versus um, uh, the vacuum of space. Or just say gravity versus a vacuum. Vacuum will always win. Always, always, always. There, there is no situation where gravity will win against or against a vacuum. And you're saying, what do you mean? It's like, okay, if you drink a soda with a straw out of a glass, what are you doing? Well, gravity is holding the soda in. You're using a vacuum force. Your mouth, you're you're winning. And that's just your mouth. That's nothing. 
Um, you can you can submit you can take a, a vacuum cleaner and pick up a, a bowling ball with it very very easily, and you can take it even even further. Um, again, you could take the second floor of your building, turn it into a vacuum chamber, pop the cork, you know, and what's going to happen? It's not like the movies. I think it's just violent. It's instant, and it equalizes. You know, pressure cannot exist next to non-pressure without a container. It's a, it's a law of thermodynamics. It's a straight up law. And so the question is, why didn't gravity keep the air in your room instead of letting it go upstairs? Well, because and you say, well, because the vacuum was stronger. I go, that's my point. My point is, when you walk outside, why are you still breathing? Mm-hmm. And, and your initial response, because we're trained this, is like, well, because of gravity. It's like, you mean the same gravity that right over there couldn't keep you couldn't keep the grab you know the the air in your room but you're keeping it here outside how, how does that work because if you believe mainstream the space is this massive massive perfect vacuum chamber it's huge if, if you believe it it's it's the most impossible vacuum ever how did how does that work tell me where no scientist has ever come back where exactly does space end or our atmosphere end and space begin where is that and tell me exactly what happens in that line Nobody ever, never talks about it. It's, it's one of those little things that we just kind of skate over because the average person doesn't know what it's supposed to mean. Sorry. Oh, no, you're good. You're good. Um, yeah, that's uh, some that I've always wondered about flat Earth is if there has to be something underneath us to hold us there, right? Yeah. Uh, it would have to be there for a very long stretch of land. I wouldn't understand how that works, right? So what we understand or what we believe about the globe Earth model is that you have the universe and it could be infinitely expansive. And, you know, we have a concept of infinity. Yeah. And then what would that be in the flat Earth model? The concept of infinity? Uh, there is no infinite. Well, okay. If you, a third, maybe less than a third. Of flat earthers don't believe in the dome, which means they don't believe in a pressurized system, which of course leads into the problem, which I just mentioned, which was that you can't have pressure next to non-pressure. So the, it, some people talk about the infinite plane, but those people, the only reason they're doing that is because the, the, the idea of a domed structure becomes claustrophobic. We don't, human beings generally don't like confinement. Even the concept of confinement, regardless of how comfortable it is. We like the, the option. It's like, well, if I had a spaceship, I could go off forever and, and go do things. And so when you tell people, it's like, no, you're in a dome. You know, you, you basically, the universe is not this huge thing. It's a one-room studio apartment. Some people freak out by that. So there is no, in my model anyway, and the majority of the, the, the people that I hang out with, the, um, uh, it's an enclosed system. And there is no infinite anything. Uh, it's, you know, we're living, you know, and again, I could probably pop it up here real fast. I've got a little prop, which is, you know, if that's it right there, then, um, it could be sitting anywhere along with a whole bunch of other ones just like it. So it doesn't have to be infinite. Why, why would it be? I mean, the infinite thing, it helps with our imagination and it helps us create things, but it's not necessary. You don't need it. Um, the only problem is, is that once you tell people again, <laughs> that you're in this, uh, eventually all they're going to, they're just going to be consumed with it. All they're going to care about is the structure and the limit of it and what's outside it and why can't we get outside it and so on and so on. Yeah. Um, so what is outside the dome going upwards? Hey. I'd like to think, it, again, it was an unlimited universe. So do I think, one, do I think this is a one-off? No, I don't. I think there's probably way more than just one of these in various stages of development all over the place. So your guess is as good as mine is what's up beyond it because we can't see beyond it. You know, literally this thing could be sitting on your desk. So when you're asking, you know, what's beyond it, it's like, at that point, does it matter? <laughs> because you're outside of the, the known universe. You're outside of what you perceived. Um, do I, you know, could it be, you know, just a Petri dish on God's desk? Yeah, maybe. Uh, but this, that point, you're, what I, the short version is I try to only live one world at a time. But what I think is outside of this is an unlimited universe. 
That's what I think, because the confinement and all the restrictions inside, it feels like we're in some sort of school. I remember the world can only be one of three things, either entertainment, confinement, or some sort of educational system. Well, if it's entertainment, I'm not necessarily buying it, not least from what our standpoint is, because there's a lot of people that just aren't having fun. I mean, this world is conflict all over the place. War is never fun. Well, maybe it is for a few people. The um, the other one is confinement. If it is a prison, well, it's an awfully nice prison. And literally, if you took the, the people off of, of that, you know, took them out of the world, the world runs just fine without them, endlessly without them. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's cycles of this and that, but it's not going to wipe itself out. It's perfectly balanced. Uh, the only, and again, which is kind of like, it feels like school. It feels like we're here to learn something. And that's what I think it is. We're here to learn perspective. And so do you think that the flat earth conspiracy sort of links to any other conspiracy, such as like a world order sort of thing? Like what is, what is the driving force? Who, who is suppressing the movement of information uh, the because... people that have to lose the most the people that built the civilization so some governments maybe you know the people with bank accounts that the numbers are meaningless because they're so huge the the problem with and if you want to say lizard people that's fine but let's <laughs> just stick to humans for now or humanoids which is uh eventually people die so uh, you know there's people that have lived their entire lifetime and, and done legacy things with their kids and their kids are trying to keep the secret who knows i mean there's so many secret societies out there which i love it's one of the things about the conspiracy world which is really interesting is that if you gave people a top 20 list and had it's like okay here who are the top 20 secret groups in order of importance and you compared that with other people oh you just you never get the same list twice because i mean where, where do you start uh the rothschilds the the bilderbergs the trilateral commission the cfr the vatican the masons a jewish cabal you just go on and on and on and on and so but the people at the highest level are, are just a conglomerate of those groups the ones that have their thumb on civilization you know the controlled economy the the world that they built they don't want change they had things a particular in a particular way and now it comes down to can they change it to use it to their advantage and without wipe without destroying it can you tell people that you're living in some sort of building and still get your agenda pushed forward i don't know maybe you might be able to do it i mean people it's amazing how receptive they are to the media a perfect example would be the um the mask shortage which i love so much uh very very recent right you can go around any store you can't find any freaking masks well it was interesting because at no point did any media group anywhere say go buy masks what they did was whenever they said ran a corona story they used a, a thumbnail underneath or some sort of image of somebody wearing a mask right because they had so much stock footage because the Asians are just nuts over wearing masks. And they have been for years. I don't know what it is. I mean, I've, I've, I've seen it 10 years ago. And so there was so yeah, much stock footage. Very uh, sterile culture. Yeah, whatever. So, <laughs> so they, they put those out there. And then all of a sudden, what happened? When the panic buying started, what did people do? They went out and started buying masks for no apparent reason at whatsoever. So, yeah. If you, I think now you might be able to pull it off. You know, you might be able to introduce the world as it is. Uh, and because the media, they're very, very tied to it. You can, you can push out the same story to basically televisions that people are holding in their hands uh, all over the world, sim almost simultaneously. And you could get the story, you could get the same narrative for 90 something percent of the population. Yeah, this is something that I absolutely love about um the coronavirus is that there are the people who will absolutely swear to you there is big pharma they're trying to get your money they're trying to make you sick so that they can get your money and then they're paying 60 dollars for a mask yeah. as soon as they hear about the coronavirus and right like, well hypocritical it's an interesting and i don't want to necessarily delve into it too much but you're talking about a conspiracy in the making right now you know it's the it is not acting I, I, you know, if you go into conspiracies long enough, you, you start to pick up things. And I'm, a, I'm like, I like history and I like disasters in history. And it is not acting like a natural virus in any way, shape or form. It's just not. It's, it's too slow. 
especially in the United States. I mean, we have a lot of international airports in the United States and everybody knows. I mean, it's it's like when a bug hits an air, airplane. I mean, every, and I'm, I'm not necessarily saying that Hollywood got it completely right because there's a lot of movies that are wrong, but there are some movies and books and television shows which were spot on and they all say the same thing, which is when a virus hits an airplane, once it gets to an airport, a, you know, a big hub, that's it. Everybody gets it in in um, in two weeks. Everybody is exposed to it in two weeks because everybody gets off those planes and they go off to other planes. Look, a plane is basically an incubator for that stuff. The same air is circulating. You're sharing two bathrooms and you're with these people for hours, hours and hours and hours. And yet, you know, the 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 caseload in the United States has been very very small. So there's something else going on here. The, the way they're rolling it out, there's, there's multiple levels to it, and we're not going to even be able to dissect it for a while because it's still, it's still in progress. But it just there's just a lot of it that does not make sense. It wouldn't act like this. It would, be, it would have already have happened. And the things that are shutting down, they're shutting down in the wrong order. Meaning, um, so university, you know, a couple universities um, closed down their, their campuses. Um, in, and had people go to the dorms. Well, why would you go to the dorms? I mean, the dorms are even worse as far as people packed into an area. And then Harvard said, okay, we're pulling them out of the dorms. But the other universities aren't. And yet all the public schools, the high schools, the junior highs, the elementaries, they're all still open. And they're all still going to the cafeterias. And it's like, and that, that will change if a child, and again, why wouldn't, if you're saying the elderly are the most prone to this, but there's some, so, but no children, children are absolutely immune. I mean, there's, 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 there's plot holes. I'm a huge believer in, in good writing, <laughs> big believer in good writing. And I've a movie, I, I will stay with a story or a movie as long as the writing is good. If there's enough plot holes, the, the reason why they call them plot holes is eventually the boat, the story boat just sinks and that's it. It's like, you're not invested anymore. And that's what this feels like right now. It's like there's there's stuff in here that just isn't making any sense. And we're not going to know the the full ramifications until it finally blossoms. And it hasn't yet. So you'll you'll know the the panic, pff, the, the panic buying you're seeing now. That's nothing <laughs> compared to the panic buying that will follow. Oh, yeah, I definitely think me personally, I think there might be something up with the coronavirus that is very unusual and especially considering just the kind of virus it is and the kind of effect that it's been taking yeah it doesn't it's not really proportionate in my opinion no. the way that i'm looking at it no it's not and, uh, and 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 it's almost like it's like fine it there's hundreds of people dying in italy but the italian americans on the east coast are unaffected um you know if it's a genetic thing and you know china's saying oh it's not a problem over here but the, the, there's some little things that bothered me um of course one of them is the fact that they're not showing the faces of the victims Right. I mean, we're notorious America. We love we love running those stories, the sympathy stories. It's like, oh, it's a father or two. And, you know, leave, leaves behind a, a loving wife and he was a firefighter and all this other crap. You know, we love breaking down the backstories of people. Nobody has that has died has gotten an expose at all. And just and people say, well, it's a privacy issue. It's like, why? It's, there's no shame in this at all. It's not like yeah. AIDS or Ebola or something really weird. <laughs> It's, yeah. it's like, why are you not showing anybody who's, who's died? And the states that are, that are, um, here, here's, here's another one real fast, which is, so uh, Washington, California, New York, those are the big ones, right? Why exactly? Uh, there's no, it, it, the, the way it's spreading doesn't spread like you would normally expect. Um, and people say it, like a perfect example would be, uh, Phoenix. Well, it has one case in the whole state of Arizona, right? And people say, well, it's because it's a warmer climate. Everybody knows that, that viruses can't survive on surfaces in warm, warm climate. It's going, okay, first off, it's March, so it's not that hot in Phoenix right this second. Uh, second, though, this is the, the bigger point, is that the airport is a massive international airport. Lots of planes go through Phoenix. Uh, so no international flights that have landed in Phoenix in the last two months. N no, nobody went out into Phoenix Somewhere, you know, you go into your car at room temperature, you know, you, nobody's, everyone's keeping everything at room temperature. You go to your home. You didn't, inf nobody got infected anywhere ever. It, it just spread in, in Washington nursing homes and a couple places in California. And the National Guard's been called out in New York. The, the, the way thing, the staging, the way it's happening, it's like, it's almost like managed panic. Like you're trying to manage a crisis, the actual crisis itself. Um, I'll, I'll give you one more real quick, not, not to dwell on this too much. 
um, which is when I was when I was driving around doing the whole grocery thing. We were picking up a, a chemo bag, uh, making a chemo kit for a friend of ours that has cancer, and uh, I knew there weren't going to be masks. I had extra masks because I was a prepper anyway. But what was interesting was is that there were no masks to be found in a fifty mile radius. Nowhere. I mean, Walmart, Target, Home Depot, anywhere that sold these freaking masks, they were gone. They were all gone, right? Right. At no time when I was shopping around for all the other things did I ever see a single person with a mask on. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is, a, I have a theory behind this. It's like this subliminal theory, which is that people are buying this stuff and they're waiting for the media to tell them when the crisis is green lit <laughs> meaning the apocalypse i'm not kidding you it's like they're waiting for the news to say and the apocalypse starts in three two one go <laughs> right and people's like you know immediately like everyone puts on their mask at the same time that's the sort of mentality we're talking about here um even the stupid thing like the toilet paper again nobody said anything about buying toilet paper ever no one said anything. In fact, it's not a it's not a diuretic disease. It's not an intestinal thing, right? It's it's a lung thing. So and and the and and so people are trying to speculate on it. No, I know exactly why. I got to see. I was in Costco. I watched it happen. <clears throat> it's because in a crisis, people still go down to the basics, and and one of the basics is you will always use toilet paper. It will never hurt to buy too much toilet paper. And then the panic thing starts in. Well, it's like, well, why why should I buy four rolls when I can buy a hundred? So, right. Okay. And then you see, and of course, you know, you see the next guy, you know, buying. It's like he's bought two hundred. And next thing you know, you're ordering your kids like Billy, get an extra shopping cart. It's like I don't want to get an extra shopping cart. We're filling it full of toilet paper. You're embarrassing me, mom. Yeah, I know, yeah. I know. And in <laughs> fact, there was a there was a person yesterday. Um, I had family in Costco yesterday, as a matter of fact, just yesterday, and they were limiting it to one brick. You know, Costco bricks of toilet paper. One brick per person, right? This shows you the mentality. So a guy buys it, puts it in his car, comes back, goes to a different register. But you remember, everything's everything's tracked. They saw that he had bought one just an hour earlier, not even an hour earlier, and they sent him packing. And they said, sorry, you already bought a brick today. You have to come back tomorrow. Oh, but, the, but the fact that he can, I mean, again, that's your, that's, that's the mentality, you know, you should be space, you know, think about your neighbor. No, <laughs> hmm. no, I wrote, I mean, literally I wrote a survival guide that delves into that whole thing. And that was after Katrina, you know, people, people protect their own interests. People that, sorry, not, not to ramble too much, but there's a, a line from uh, Heath Ledger, you know, the Batman movie when he was the Joker. And it, it still stuck with me to this day, which is he goes, he goes, he goes, you wait, you know, because he was saying the Batman, why are you saving these people? They're the most selfish things ever. He goes, when the chips are down, these civilized people, they'll eat each other. <laughs> and he wasn't kidding. And so that whole thing with the ferry, it's like, oh, I'm not going to blow them up. No, hell, both those boats would have blown up. <laughs> <laughs> that, that movie would have ended 20 minutes earlier. So, um. We've talked a little bit about the coronavirus. Are there any other uh, are there any other kind of conspiracies besides flat Earth that you think have some merit to them? Oh, tons! I mean, tons. Um, I could uh, usually I'll break them down really quick for you. Um, I'll give you my favorites. And these will upset some people, but your friend will probably uh, get really excited about it. Yeah. which is i'll have him uh watch this back later and if he if he can get back uh from work in the time uh, it, like it's if this not a big running deal. What, what's his name uh his name is coral farmer it goes by galaxy Co uh, coral? These are Discord. Co coral coral farmer yeah because he has a a fish sort of right. tank with coral coral farmer you're missing out we're talking about good stuff so oh yeah so here's the deal so like we'll just rattle off a few really quick um, 9-11. Okay, was it an inside job? Easy enough, I can I can do that one in a couple sentences, which is, you don't think it was an inside job? Tell me what happened to Building 7. Most of Americans don't even know that Building 7 fell. A 50-story building that wasn't, that was not hit by a plane, that was barely even glanced by debris. A fire starts in the basement for no apparent reason, and the building just implodes five hours later. Just drops. Mm -hmm. 
for no apparent reason whatsoever. But because the island was evacuated by that point, hardly anyone saw it. But they did film it. Now, here's the part that throws people. It's like, oh, maybe it was a fire. I mean, it's like, really? Because a fire, if that was the case, then there would be no demolition teams. All you have to do is set a fire in a building and eventually it would just implode at perfect free fall speed and implode on itself. But the big thing was, was there was a, um, a British news team and you can look it up. It's, it's, it's a matter of public record and it's out there on YouTube. The British news team reported it falling 20 minutes before it fell. The reason the reason they did that was because and I knew because I was in the time and attendance industry when it happened. I was literally I knew because people screw up time zones. They do it all the time. In fact, in America, most people in Americans don't even know there's four time zones in America, not three. But people forget it. They like mountain time zone is like ignored because nobody lives in mountain time zone by comparison. And what happened was they were told to report on this, which was interesting because remember they're news readers and they were told to report it and they screw up the time zone. So instead of reporting it 40 minutes after it fell, they reported it 20 minutes before it fell. That's 9-11. Uh, Sandy Hook. Let's, let's do that one really early, um, uh, really quickly, I should say, which is uh, I will pay $1,000 PayPal to the first person that sends me a 10 second video clip video. I'm going to say this three times, video, video, video of any kid being carried out of that building. It's never happened. And you say, well, who cares? Well, it does, it does matter a lot because that's how the whole operation got completely botched, which was, you remember, it was first thing in the morning, right? The shooting happened like right first thing in the morning. And what happened was the traffic helicopters, which were full of gas, they had nothing better to do, went fly over and they just hovered above the school. And shot HD footage. Just shot it, shot it, shot it, shot it. Nobody came out of the school. Nobody came out of the school. 600 kids. You know how long it takes to evacuate a grade school? <laughs> long time. Right. You have to clear room by room. I mean, these are kids. This isn't high school. You want to look at the nightmare, look at Columbine. I don't care what the conspiracy in Columbine was. <laughs> just look at the chaos that was going. Just There were kids jumping out of windows and breaking arms and legs. It was awful. It was a mess. 600 yeah. kids trying to get them out of grade school. Not a single kid came out of there. Not one. Tell me how that happened. $1,000. I'll pay PayPal it to you. Show me. All you will find, if you look this up, is three still shots of some kids being with hands on each other's backs, walking out of a parking lot, you know, in the middle of a parking lot with the school. You can't even see the school in the background. And when was this shot taken? And moreover, who was the reporter that shot it? And how'd they get in there? And where were the guys with guns? You know, the, the cops would have been there with, with kids under each arm. Yeah, no, 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 no. Uh, th that's Sandy Hook. Um, other ones, JFK, that's too easy. I mean, if you if you can watch uh, Oliver Stone's JFK without thinking and still think, oh, yeah, I was absolutely, you know, a lone gunman, come on. In fact, JFK was a pr such a great example because it was a lone gunman who was then, get this, killed by a lone gunman. Uh -huh. Brilliant. Love it. Uh, Pearl Harbor, probably too big for most people. And that is Pearl Harbor had to be attacked. It's not that it should have, that, that, that it was inevitable. It was that if it isn't attacked, um, Pearl Harbor, then everyone's speaking German now. Germans had won World War II. It was done. It was, it was absolutely over. They were just mopping up. But people don't talk about that. It was, no one would have found out about the Holocaust, this thing. It was, it was a done deal. They had, Russia was burning <laughs> to the ground. England was, was not sleeping because they knew one day they were going to come in. And then all of a sudden the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor and the Americans get into the war and, and the rest is, as they say, is history. You had, Pearl Harbor had to be attacked. We had to bait the Japanese to get them in. What are you willing to do to save the world? Are you willing to, to make sacrifices? And that applies with every American war that we've ever fought. Um, notably, uh, like the, the Mexican-American war, which most people don't understand, which was a big land grab, which was um, you sacrifice the Alamo, 200 people. What do you get in exchange for that? Oh, well, let's see. Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, because there used to be an old Mexico, and that worthless pay, uh, pl uh, piece of real estate called California trillions of dollars in real estate in adjusted dollars for 200 men can't put a price on human life of course you can we do it all the time um same thing happened with the spanish-american war we sacrificed the main a couple hundred people what do you get for that oh let's see philippines puerto rico guam <laughs> and uh probably could have gotten cuba if we if we spent a little more effort on it and we didn't uh, too bad 
Um, the, uh, the Vietnam War was for ulterior motives. The, the Gulf War was for ulterior motives. Uh, every war we've ever fought. I mean, heck, even the, the American Civil War. People think, oh, it was about slavery. No, it wasn't. It was about money. That's all it was. It was the last chance. It was the best chance that England had to take America. Remember, they'd already tried twice. They tried it in the Revolutionary War against the French. Lost to the French. Not us. Um, the War of 1812 barely held on. In fact, the, it was just a reconnaissance force that initially took us. And then the British said, okay, well, all we have to do is take, off the, take out the French. So that way the French aren't backing up America. And maybe we'll still have enough strength to take them out. Beat France, Waterloo, Napoleon, that whole thing. Come back to America. Lost the Battle of New Orleans. And uh, so their last chance with the Civil War. The, it wasn't the South versus the North. It was supposed to be the South and the British Navy versus the North. And then the United States, the myth goes, and I believe it, that the, the United States asked the, the Russian Navy to get involved. You know, paid them off and said, look, <laughs> we need help. The North was not going to win against the South and the British. It just wasn't going to happen. Um, any other conspiracies other than that? That, that? I mean, obviously the moon landing, but that's, that's tied mostly to, to Flat Earth. Those are my favorites. Right. Um, everything else, you know, they're, they're smaller. There's other you know, stuff that's out there, but those are, are great ones to throw at people. I'll, I'll give you one more real quick, though, which is, um, uh, oh, great. We are first cases on the island reported just now. That's about 50 miles north of me. Uh, lovely. Um, okay, so here's one that most people haven't even heard of. Uh, it was in my book, and uh, I, I claim exclusive rights to it, which is the Panama Canal. You're probably saying Panama Canal. That's not a conspiracy. In fact, this will impress your friend. You ready? This is for right. this is for coral, which is the Panama Canal. It was just a big engineering thing, right? That's all it was. It's just a big ditch connecting two oceans, basically a lake, saltwater lake, but it was basically connecting two oceans. Um, and it took a lot of men to build it compared to like the Hoover Dam, which was very, very big. Hoover Dam lost 70 men in the construction of it happens, right? People build things. Construction accidents happen all the time. Lost 70 men. Do you have any men were lost in the building of the Panama Canal? Um, I'd say a lot. The better uh, part of 6,000. Now, okay. and, and then you're saying, wow, that's a lot. Why haven't I heard of this? And I say, well... The uh, they died of malaria and yellow fever, and you're going well. That's what happens. You go down there; it's a jungle, mosquitoes, yellow fever. You're going to die. I'm going yeah. But what if I told you they knew full well they were going to kill them, and they sent them anyway? And you say no, no, that's not what we do. I go yeah, it is because we didn't. The Americans didn't come up with the Panama Canal idea. It was initially the French. French pretty smart. They came out and tried to do it in the late 1800s, just before we got there. And they didn't know anything about mosquito netting or bug spray or any of that stuff. And they lost men in freaking droves to the tune of 21,000 men. I mean, there's been wars fought, which haven't lost that many men. Just just lost, just died, died, died. And so many that they just quit. They said, ah, screw it, it's not worth it. They go home and we, and we come in. So where's the conspiracy, you say? The conspiracy is this. If I'm an engineer or whatever I'm doing and I want to sign up for this and I go to the recruiter, remember, these are civilians and they say, oh, yeah, I go down there. What about safety concerns? You're going to tell those guys that they have a one in eight chance of just dying. No, <laughs> you are not going to tell them this. You're going to do it for the greater good and say, oh, no, it's fine. <laughs> just go. You're, you're good. It's sunny. It's warm. You'll love it. And that's what they did. And so did the ends justify the means? Yeah. Yeah, it did. I mean, 6,000 is a lot of guys. They were willing to lose 10,000. I have no doubt. Um, you know, it became a huge military strategic choke point, the most expensive toll road in the world, and made a lot of money for the Americans. Did the ends justify the means? Yeah, it did. So, again, there's your classic example of why conspiracies happen. Conspiracy, the classic definition is when three or more people conspire to do something that may be illegal or, and or unethical. Now, does the greater good cancel that out? Yeah, a lot of times it does. It does, right. because they don't want to debate it with people. There's decisions that governments make for the public because they don't want to get into that debate. It's like, we're not going to, because a lot of the times the debate would never end. You know, people, people, people don't want that on their conscience. They just don't want to do it. So governments make calls. It's like, yeah, we're going to do something horrible. 
but most of the people are going to benefit from it. But in order to do it, we're going to sacrifice something. It's the it's the old argument, um, you know, would you sacrifice a child to cure cancer? A lot of people would. But then you say, would you sacrifice your own child to sacrifice, to cure cancer? It's the impossible choice. You can't make it. You, you cannot make it. You'd freeze in your tracks. Most mothers would just stand there and be like, no. Or or they'd make the decisions. No, my kid. It's like, you know, you're going to kill a million people if, if you try to save that child. Don't care. We see it in movies from time to time. It drives me nuts. Yeah. Um, speaking on topic of conspiracies, uh, not just conspiracy theories, were you aware of um, any conspiracies that at the time there might have been theories going on and then later they came out like, yeah, it actually happened? Cons conspiracies that were pro I'm sorry were conspiracies that were proved wrong or no conspiracy theories that were later proven right oh uh no because most of them are I mean, you know conspiracies don't happen that often um maybe little ones I mean obviously the the newer ones that are that are tough to get into um you don't figure out a, you know hindsight type deals um like Enron for example people were calling that a conspiracy right off the bat and because everything looked really, really suspicious, you know, the, all the financials around Enron, and it turned out to be even worse <laughs> than yeah. than people had thought. Um, Harvey Weinstein was a conspiracy that just kept blossoming into something way bigger and more sinister. Um, anything really, really big? Well, I mean, the, again, I think Corona right now might be turning into it. I don't know yet, though. Um, i trying to think of anything else. No, I, I never, I never had any, when I go into conspiracies, I go into it guilty first because, and that was a change from my earlier life. When I was, when I was young, before I watched JFK, the movie in the theater back in nineties, early nineties, I didn't think that people lied on, on a big level. I didn't think the conspiracies existed. Literally it is like a lot of people, you know, you rose colored glasses. It's like, everything's great. You know, there's nothing really, really bad. But then slowly but surely as you get older, you start hearing the stuff. And the media has gotten a lot more brutal nowadays, um, which is we, for example, we don't believe we, we don't want to believe conspiracies if they hurt something that's positive, positive to us. And I'll give you a couple examples because um, we all know that, look, there's there's conspiracies in politics, business, sports, entertainment journalism even science we all know this um a, a quick recent one would be um kobe bryant there there's one for you um it's not even a conspiracy it happened but people voluntarily voluntarily forgot about it so when anyone said yeah was kobe bryant one of the top five players of all time yes he was did he bring a lot of people joy yes he did did he retire with two numbers yeah he did why is that? <laughs> and if you're in Los Angeles, you don't talk about it. I lived in Colorado when that happened. And we, you know, it was, you know, they buried it as best they could. But people forget, you know, kind of like Tiger Woods. <laughs> you know, you don't want to believe, you don't want to believe it about your heroes. You know, the, the old saying is like, you know, never meet your heroes. And so it's like people forget. It's like, look, he had two numbers because his marketing people couldn't weren't convinced they couldn't dig him out of the endorsement hole that he was in they weren't convinced it was like man you should just get a new number <laughs> it was that bad <laughs> and and so it's like hey i got no, and it worked it's like hey 24 new player really <laughs> and so mm -hmm. and so but the, it was awkward because you had when he retired you had to retire two numbers and I'm sure people in the audience that never even heard of um, Caitlin Faber. <laughs> it's like going, why is there two numbers again? It's like, no, because it never happened. You don't have two numbers on the same team. You have two numbers for different number for different teams because people that are traded, but never for the same team. It doesn't make any sense. I think it's the first time it's ever happened. Um, like little things, like whenever it happens to a media person, like um, Matt Lauer, <laughs> perfect example. You know, a uh, morning, morning talk show host, years doing it. And when the stories finally came out, that was it. You know, it, you, you didn't want to believe it. And then all of a sudden it was believable. Okay, I'll give you one more real quick. Um, perfect example would be uh, Lance Armstrong. Lance Armstrong, right? World famous cyclist, won tournament, Tour de France, Tour de France, just crushed it, right? Crushed it. 
was he doping? Right? Was he was he using performance enhancing drugs? I don't care about the cancer thing. You know, who cares about that, right? Yes, he survived testicular cancer. Great, good for you. Did he use that to kind of blur the lines to where the performance enhancing drugs that he was using was making him win? Yes, it was. But every year, every press conference for every year for seven years, he just lied straight to the camera's face. You know, because they asked him all the time. It's like, are you doing, you know, are you using, you know, performance drugs? No, I'm not. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. <laughs> and after seven years, finally, one of his dope dealers, the guys that was coming up with this shit for him, they came to him and, and, and basically ratted him out. They had him. And then he all of a sudden he comes on camera and he goes, yeah, yeah, I, I've been doing the whole time. <laughs> I've been lying to you <laughs> the whole time. That, that just, I mean, he almost single-handedly destroyed the cycling, everything about cycling. Just right there. I mean, they stripped him of everything and it was awful. The rules, sorry, let me end this part with this. Um, the rules of the world now are, are this. The lawyer's um, mantra still applies. The, the fact that it's the lawyer's code now. The lawyer's rules, which is... You deny, you deny, you deny until they absolutely have you. And then maybe, and only if you have no other option, do you admit it. Plea deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah maybe you plea deal. Maybe. And if there's no plea deal, well, then you're screwed. But that's it. I mean, the, the, every lawyer, it's, it's, the lawyer will tell you, it's like, it's, it doesn't matter if you're guilty. Don't admit it. Which is why, right. by the way, if you ever are, you ever think you're going to get arrested, you shut up. <laughs> I don't right. care what you, what you watch on television. It's like, oh, if you lawyer up, you're guilty. It doesn't matter. You shut up. Right. <laughs> you don't talk yeah. about anything. I was anything. watching this, um, <laughs> this really good seminar about, uh, it was done by a lawyer, and he was saying, right, look, it doesn't matter whether you're guilty, you're innocent, when the cops come and knock on your door, you call your lawyer. Yep. Because anything that you say, it can be used against you, but it will never be used for yes, you. Yes, in fact, I know which one you're talking about, and you're, and he's absolutely right. Um, and that's the key. In fact, they tell you this up front. Anything you can say, we've all heard it, so anything you can say can and will be used against you in a court of law. Which they're basically telling you, whatever you say right now, mm -hmm. we're going we're to we're record every second of it, <laughs> and we will mm -hmm. use it in court against you right. you will would end the again they don't i i know you know the, the what you're talking about where he says um yeah it, it'll never benefit you ever oh well, the cop may be a nice guy and he may want you you know he may he may want you but it's not up to him it's up to the prosecutor yeah. in court that's just hearsay yeah in the, in the court it's like who cares yeah so never right. ever you know again people people blow it because they so many people just want to confess i don't know why they just want, yeah. they just they it's like they're begging to. I mean, maybe it's the ones that feel guilty. Who knows? But I mean, yeah. there's people who confess who later you find out they were actually innocent. And they just the cops had them really good on the interview. Yeah, that's what the prosecutor is trying to do. The prosecutor is just trying to find somebody who fits the bill, might be guilty, and you know, if you slip up, say something a bit suspicious, that might be enough. Absolutely right. Um, and one more thing I should throw in that there is, and that is the television because there's so many cop shows. I mean, there's so many cop shows out there, and in almost all of them, watch if you if you go through them. I, I challenge anybody. Very few times will you ever see them go through. Remember, it's a fictional account, right? They'll where the person will say lawyer, and then they don't say anything because that's bad television. They will always have the guy eventually crack and give up all sorts of stuff, either by threat or you know we had your guy or he's he's tricked or whatever it is. They will always right. confess because it's better television to do that, even though it absolutely goes against what you're supposed to do. But since you see that so many times, I think in a lot of people, it's like, well, you know, in Law and Order, they confess all the time. That's because that's if they don't, the show is 20 minutes shorter. Because, mm -hmm. you, you know, that's the last thing you want to do is television, have somebody sit there. You know, it's like, well, you want to talk about it? You know, you're not supposed to, you're not supposed to say anything. That's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to sit there and not say anything. That's what you're supposed to do. And and that, they even tell you that, again, with the whole rights, the Miranda rights. They tell you, basically, that's what you're supposed to do without saying it. Mm -hmm. You know, the, if yeah. the in fact, if the cops wanted to wreck their lives, they instead of doing, they should modify Miranda's to say, <laughs> if I were you, I'd shut up. <laughs> right. So. Yeah, they, they have such a nice way of putting it. They're like, you have the right to remain silent. Yeah. Uh, silent. 
Yeah. But really, they're just like, yo, we we really trying to get you in jail. I mean, like, don't don't talk. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's amazing how many people don't listen to it. It's like they just gloss over it. Anyway, what else you got? Uh, yeah. So, I myself used to not be very open minded with conspiracy theories or conspiracies in general. Um. To an extent, I'm still not. Like, I'm not going around researching every conspiracy, maybe adopting it. But one thing that did open my eyes was the Iran-Contra. Uh, when all of that stuff came out, oh, yeah. and they were talking about, yep, this is what we did, this is what was going on in Nicaragua, uh, this is how we were operating the whole thing, and I'm sitting there like, conspiracies are really happening out here. Uh, yeah, did you ever watch um, any of the Netflix series Narcos? Uh, no, never. it's a it's it's a look into the drug trade, but they kind of dabble into the the gun running part of it. And the short version is this: it's like, look, here's another here's another little conspiracy for you, which is because <laughs> I, I laugh nowadays because you, you we've always heard that you know the term for years and years the war on drugs. There is no war on drugs. There there never will be, and the reason is yeah, this: no. is because pe Americans always will buy drugs. <laughs> That's it. You get a uh, twenty uh, percent of the population is drug um, receptive, for lack of a better term. They they will buy drugs. Twenty percent of the population, some way or another. And if you can't stop the people from buying drugs, then why are you fighting the the groups from South America and Mexico? Why are you fighting them? You can't. There's there's no point to fight them. So the first thing they did was once they realized that people were buying a lot of cocaine, <laughs> right? The, the government swooped in and they they said, well, hell, we'll... Um, in fact, they even said as much in the movie Blow with Johnny Depp, where the government came to Johnny Depp's character and said, look, we will absolutely let you make money, but we want 70%. <laughs> and Johnny Depp's character is like, keep 30% of my own money, screw you. And they busted him for it. When there's that much money going in, if, if, the, money, if the money's coming out of America... Our government is going to step in. I don't care what it is. And we're going to say, sorry, we're going to kick most of that money back into America. We're not giving you all our money. We're taking, basically, we took over the drug trade, plain and simple. And then we made it even easier. It's like, okay, fine. We can't stop people from buying these type of drugs. So we'll take over the drug trade and then we'll find it even more. We'll make uh, some drugs legal in some states. We'll let that on a state by state basis. And then we'll make prescription drugs, which will get you almost as high as, you know, the illegal stuff. So you, you, you corner that sort of thing. It's a, it's, it's a massive conspiracy, but what would you do? What would you do if you saw millions and millions of dollars a day being funneled out of your country to uh, a third world power, you know, to, to criminals in a third world power? What would you do? You know, it's like, sorry, you, you can't let that go. You either, you either burn them into the ground or you all of a sudden, in which case you're just, you know, you're doing whack-a-mole because more of them are just going to keep popping up. Exactly. Or you say, right. yeah, you know what? Let's just buy them out. Let's take over the right. routes. And, exactly. And then you also, while you're doing it, it's like, well, since we're transporting stuff over this region anyway, <laughs> let's, let's arm some guerrilla rebels. I'm sorry, freedom fighters. <laughs> let's arm some of those guys. Let's do some colonialism. We're, the, our government, despite what people think, yeah, it's, it seems slow and lethargic. But behind the scenes, there's some very intelligent, very ruthless people that get yeah. stuff done. And yeah. I and so when I'm you know when I'm watching Narcos and I'm watching other movies that tie into it, it's like yeah, yeah, like, these are good moves. It's like is it sinister to have our government run the drug trade? What would you do? It's like look, we need. We're not going to give away. We're not going to let that much money go somewhere else <laughs> the united states is very greedy <laughs> along those lines right. anyway yeah and um that's something that there was a guy named uh ricky ross yeah and he was directly tied in with uh, the iran contra he was uh buying drugs directly from blandon sure selling them here in the u.s yep the fbi was watching him the whole time or the cia was watching him the whole time yeah. And so he said, oftentimes with uh, the drug issue, uh, people try to make it a political issue because it's such a catchphrase, the war on drugs, you know, let's stop it, let's continue, right. let's pursue, whatever. Uh, but it's not a political issue. It's a medical issue because people medically need drugs. Right. And as long as there are drug addicts and people who need drugs, it, like you said, it's whack-a-mole. 
can take one down, someone's always going to pop up. The supply and demand, again, it's basic economics has been there forever, um, which is why, again, like again, watch Narcos, fascinating story. I mean, you got to understand when the demand is that high, when you're looking at America, right? And, and a lot of countries look at America as like a bunch of rich, insane people. If, if Americans are willing to spend that much money, you know, if there's that much money coming out of America, you got to understand that like just in the last 10 years, I, I, I came up with this recently, which is like, do you understand that hundreds of thousands of Mexicans <laughs> die just for the privilege of selling us drugs? <laughs> Mm-hmm. They're fighting each other. They're blowing each other away in the streets just for the opportunity to sell Americans the drugs. <laughs> That's how much money there is that we're involved here. And so, yeah, yeah, we, uh, you know, if you're if you're looking over the top and you have the power to take control of that, and, and it may take a few years to pull that off. Sure, you know, you you go to these guys, you sit down with them and say, oh, look, we'll move your product, but you're gonna get this much. If you fight again, this is what I would do. This is me, right? Because I, I can put myself in, in their shoes. Let's say you go to the Cali cartel or the Medellin cartel right down in South America back in the day. And you say, fine, we will move your product for you. This is our rates. We will guarantee you this. We will, you know, we're going to raid these shipments here and there just to make sure it looks like we're actually fighting you from time to time. And those are the terms. If you fight us, because remember, it doesn't matter how good the, the, the cartels are. They're still civilian. <laughs> Military has access to things which are vicious. If you guys have any doubt, uh, watch the wonderful movie um, Clear and Present Danger. One of the, the Tom Clancy movies from back in the day. Where it's like, fine, you, you fight us and we'll just tr- have a fighter plane <laughs> go <laughs> fly over one of your villages and literally incinerate it. You know, you cannot, you cannot battle us. So we, we honestly, I mean, come on, the, our government is the biggest gangster group of all time. And, uh, and that's really what it boils down to. It's like, you know, you can say, oh, you know, they're, they're the criminals. It's like, yeah, but everybody, you know, it's, it's the food chain. And in the end you follow the money and there we are. Yeah. So I'm aware that you made a, uh, Netflix documentary or Netflix made a documentary with you. Yeah. It's like a Netflix original. Yeah. Uh, do you plan on doing anything else with them in the future or any else, uh, any other kind of documentary? Uh, I'll do any documentary that, that happens. Do Will the, the documentary people that made Behind the Curve, uh, will they make another one with us? No, <laughs> they won't okay. um, because they hated us. And they didn't hate us personally. They hated the topic. Hated it. Oh, right. God, they hated it so much um because the uh, – mostly because there was a 12-year-old kid that, that walked up to me. Um, when I was on stage and was asking me questions from the microphone and he was very, very curious about that. And his parents, it was a school day and his parents brought him there and they were really worried about that. And so, but it was fine. I mean, the documentary did very, very well. It was picked up by everybody and it did a whole bunch of film festivals and, uh, you know, I had fun making it, but at the same time they took some shots at us that I, I didn't appreciate. But yeah. that was okay because it generated a huge amount of curiosity. And because it was somewhat friendly, honestly, the reason why it worked out the way it did is because the producers and the directors and, and or director and the editors and all that, they were not with us in any capacity. And so they, you know, mainstream embraced them. It's like, all right, you know, you can, you can show your stuff because you're, you're from the outside looking in, you're not inside the Flat Earth community. Exactly. And so it, it, again, it did very, very well uh, for Netflix and um, even got a resurgence recently, broke back into the top 10 after um, Mad Mike, you know, did his unfortunate crash. So, um, yeah, I, the only thing I would have changed at the, would have been at the end, uh, Jaren's experiment, because Jaren botched it, but at the same time, the director, you know, took some liberties with editing. And, uh, again, I, yeah, I understand, you know, they had to boil down seven months worth of work down to a hundred minutes, but they, again, they, they were biased. They said they weren't going to, and then they ended up taking a stand. And I, the only reason I knew they took a stand is because they admitted as much during the, um, the director's commentary on, um, yeah. on iTunes. They did one, they did director's commentary just for the iTunes version. And I just listened to it and it's like, and they, they just came out of nowhere and said, oh yeah, this is when we took a stand against these guys. Because they thought we yeah. were we were going to damage science in the future. It's like, oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, do you feel like that's something when you're 
uh, in the Flat Earth community, right? Mm-hmm. There's a lot of people who would really like to um, explore that, but then at the same time, they're never really going to be fully there. They're still going to be thinking, Flat Earth, this is a meme. I'm going to meme about it and not really take it seriously. Uh, it doesn't matter because if you're thinking about it, it's always in the back of your head. Uh, yeah, there's some people that, that just make memes and just do a, kind of like a surface thing and they don't look at it. But what I found out when I was doing a um, a conference with a, a radio guy down in uh, New Zealand, he said, he asked me about, I think it was called the Eighth Man Effect. And I should look it up just to make sure I haven't, I haven't bothered doing that. I'll, I'll try to do it after this, which is the Eighth Man Effect is really, really interesting. He goes, if somebody hears about a topic unsolicited from seven different people, that are unrelated to each other, right? And random times, it will be, in, it'll start sticking in their head. And when they hit their eight, the eighth man, it becomes like a subliminal peer pressure thing. Kind of like when you hear about a movie and you're like, oh, I don't have any interest in the movie. Oh, I don't have any interest in the movie. You hear about that movie enough from enough people. And it's happened to me, you know, where it's like, yeah, you know what? I'm going to freaking watch it. Just, just because I've heard it so many times. And you can do that with just about any topic. And Flat Earth kind of became that. Um, in fact, it came, became that with this guy where he goes, I kept hearing about it and people weren't approaching me with it necessarily, you know, just, you know, they, they just mentioned it in passing. I just kept hearing it in different places. And that's when it, that's when it catches up. So when people make memes about it, great. When people troll it, great. You know, I, in fact, I wish I had a thousand trolls dedicated to my videos, you know, to go after me and they don't understand. I tell them, I tell them up front, kind of like the, you know, right to remain silent thing. I tell them, I go. I go, you realize that when you make a video about Flat Earth and or me, you're basically just shooting wooden arrows into a bonfire. It, from the outside, oh yeah, it looks like something's happening. A lot of arrows flying. But all you're doing is, is adding wood to the fire. You're just making it bigger because of how the internet works and how the metrics work. And that is so, so true with us. So yeah, please, anyone that wants to make memes against us, <laughs> go right ahead. And every time you do it, every time you make fun of it, you uh, and you make a video. I mean, I've seen so all all the major channels on YouTube have done a, a flat Earth video now at one point or another. Huge channel. I mean, everyone from PewDiePie on down to just nobody. You know, they they made flat Earth videos. Why? It's because it's in there. It's in their head somewhere. They they figure and it's like they now they may make fun of it, and I don't care. Uh, in fact, the, it's the host. No offense to you, um, but it's not the host I'm interested in. It's the other, it's the people out there listening because the host will rarely, if ever change their mind on the fly. Uh, it's, right. it's the people out there that are listening anonymously. They're the ones that don't have any peer pressure on them. They're the ones that are going to start, you know, typing in stuff and looking into it. Yeah, that's, uh, I don't, I don't take any offense to that at all. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm trying to do with this, uh, sort of podcast, this is the very first episode and really I'll take anybody, you know, opinions might be very controversial you might be a super conspiracy theorist might have a very esoteric opinion whatever it may be as long as it doesn't break twitch tos i kind of just want to host it as long as you're interesting oh yeah right sure and and, and a lot uh, of people have said that in fact i've had a lot of hosts in the early days early days like three years ago that were nervous they, they would tell me beforehand they would go man i really don't know if i want to do this topic because they were afraid of the backlash um alex jones from infowars contacted right. me one of the one of the early ones in like 2016 and and of course we've done one since then i didn't do it david weiss did it from uh, ditrh but he came um he came his producers came to me and asked if they could do a flat earth uh theme without a show without actually using the words flat earth and i go <laughs> uh, i said what i go and they go well how long can we do that and i go it's not very long maybe 10 minutes i go you're, you're gonna have to say it they said no we can't take the chance forward to 2019 and uh, we had we had one of the producers had him, you know, one of one of the producers was ours, which I which I loved using that James Bond line. And it's so true for us, which is um, the first thing you need to know about us is that we have people everywhere. And we do. We, I mean, you have no idea how many people they're just all over the place. I have run into so many people that are that are into this topic, um, but they're all anonymous. You know, it's like it's one of those quiet fight club things. It's it's awesome. I in fact, yeah. I had um. I had a, a, a plane flight on um, going down to Auckland and the, I was literally just sitting there minding my own business, right? Seeing, seeing the plane and this guy, young, um, I don't know if he was Hispanic or whatever, but a young man who was passing out bread, one of the flight attendants. 
And he comes up to me. He goes, because you want any bread? And I go, no, I'm okay. And he goes, are you sure you don't want any bread? <laughs> I was like going, oh, great. It's a Mission Impossible thing. So I said, yeah, I'll take one of those uh, garlic rounds right there. And he goes, yeah, you want those because they're flat <laughs> and they're round. <laughs> it's like, what? what? He absolutely knew me. He had seen the documentary, knew exactly who I was. And, uh, and, and, and he's like looking around going, I have to pass out more bread. <laughs> and he goes around. It was awesome. It was like, and yeah, that, that sort of thing happens to me quite often now. Uh, it just blows yeah, my mind. Awesome. And, and a lot of it was because of the documentary. Yeah, that sounds, yeah, that sounds really awesome. Uh, when, when you said, uh, when you said he didn't use discord, right? Uh, literally until I contacted you, yeah. I had a buddy of mine who was going to come on the podcast, uh, as a first member and he had some really bizarre ideas and I'm thinking this is going to be a really fun podcast. He mentions you to me and he says, it would be really cool if you tried to get in contact with Mark Sargent and see if you can get him on. And I was like shot in the dark, literally brand new Twitch channel, almost no viewers. <laughs> who knows what he's going to say? Yeah. I message you when I get you on, um, this man. Oh, this man, where was I going with this? Oh man, I had it. On, I had it right on the tip of my what, tongue. What? What about me? Or God? Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, he uses Discord, right? Yeah. And so he was telling me about you, and he's a really interesting guy, but he's kind of a bit of a boomer, right? He has some really boomer takes sometimes. Me? And so he mentions you. No, not you. Oh, no. a different guy. Uh, yeah. yeah, the le the the guy I was gonna have on before you. Yeah. So he tells me to message you, and I message you, and I ask you to hop on Discord. Yeah. And you say you don't use uh, Discord. Yeah, and I'm like, yeah. And I was thinking, oh, wait a minute. I got his contact from someone who's pretty boomerish. I'm thinking Mark Sargent might be a bit of a boomer. And then I get on, I get on talk with you, and uh, no, nah, you're pretty, uh, you're pretty interesting guy. Uh, you're, you're up with the memes, uh, you know. Well, if you're, if I'm on, if you're online a lot, you pick up some things. But there's some things I won't do. Like for example, um, uh, I'm not a boomer. Oh, I'm Gen X, obviously. But, um, I, like, I've never sent a text in my life, not because I don't know how to send a text, but because I think a lot has been lost in translation because of texting. So right. I just refuse to, it's like, look, I'm old school. I grew up, you know, with tech support phone. I mean, I trained, I mean, I literally spent years on the phone and that's because you can get so much more done, but I know it's socially easier to text. I get it. And that is, right. again, it starts with dating in high school, which is like, oh, I can ask somebody out on a date and I don't have to freaking crap my pants while I'm asking her out. And once you do that, that reinforcement, you know, then all of a sudden it's like, hey, the relationship starts with a text and it probably ends with a text. Um, but there are other things. I mean, yeah, I don't use I don't use Discord. I don't have Instagram in fact, or, or Facebook or um, Twitch or, or, or um, Snapchat or any of the others. Mostly because uh, I just don't have time. I mean, I, my YouTube thing, I'm throwing a lot of the stuff on there. And I just don't want to be stretched too thin. So I have other people. It's like, look, if it's going to get out, it's going to get out regardless of what I, where I put it. People can just share my stuff. So if they do, great. I mean, look, look what happened with Netflix. I didn't even have to do anything with that. And uh, yeah. Netflix has nothing to do with any of those other previous things. Yeah. So. Um, what do you think? What do you think about the Netflix thing, right? Like you mentioned, you didn't have to do much to kind of get that attention from Netflix. Yeah. Do you think sometimes it backfires a bit? Like you're this guy with this idea and you want to get it out there. And then all of a sudden, all of the lights get on you. You're on the news. Netflix is at the door trying to get a deal with you. Uh, how is that? Uh, that was a little different. And it didn't happen the way that most people think. A lot of people don't understand that um, when it comes to film, especially independent films or documentaries, you make them and then if you don't have a buyer right away, which they didn't, you have to go to film festivals. And then during those film festivals, word of mouth shows up, you know, you make it to the top 10 of this and that. And there's so many films that don't get into film festivals. Like our first one was Toronto and there were 3000 submissions and they only could use a hundred films. And we made it into the hundred and then we made it into the top 10. We didn't win any awards, but we were always in this group of things to watch. But Flat Earth is so weird, it's not going to win an award. So Netflix didn't didn't buy it right away. Um, it was picked up by iTunes first, I believe, and then um, YouTube, 
Red maybe I think picked it up. Uh, some of the other smaller ones picked it up. Oh, Amazon picked it up. And then uh, finally Netflix picked it up at the end of um, 2018. They, they picked it up going into the beginning of 2019. And um, it was, but again, I you don't know. You don't know what resonates with people. I mean, the producers had no faith whatsoever. They didn't even know it was going to pick, get picked up at all. They didn't even think they were going to get into film festivals. You don't know what's going to resonate with the public. So again, would I have changed some things? Maybe a few, but since I had the privilege of actually going to some of these film festivals and sitting in theaters and watching it with people, you know, with a hat and glasses, um, I got to see what happened. And I saw the reaction and, and the blend of how things work and what, what resonates. And so, no, I, again, I, it exposed people a, a lot to the topic and it was safe. It, would, it made people safe, even the title, Behind the Curve, because they're dumb people, right? Or Behind the Curve. It made people feel safe to even watch it. So, and that was, that was it. They go in, it's like, well, we're going to make fun of stupid people. And then, the, and all of a sudden, in fact, the first 20 minutes, I'm not kidding you, the first 20, 25 minutes of the movie, people didn't even think it was real. They thought it was a, a piece of docufiction where it was like, oh, it was like a parody of something. It's like, well, these people are it, like, yeah. they're not real people. And then all of a sudden, like 25 minutes, they're going, wait a minute, there's something really big and scary on the internet and I've never heard of it. And it's flat earth. There's... Yeah. And then, then all of a sudden, in fact, there was um, a, a story, people have heard this a million times, but. Uh, there was an editor in Hollywood who we showed it to, uh, and he knew nothing about anything. And, and the editor said, okay, just watch this, you know, no context. And afterwards he was blown away and he says, wow, he goes, what sort of budget did you have for this movie? Right. It's like, what do you mean? He goes, all those actors, they played it so straight, so real. <laughs> you know, he literally did not believe that anyone in the movie was real. He thought that everyone was an actor. And then they had to break it to him. It's like, no, man. They was, that was a, he goes, that conference, that thing in Raleigh, that was a real thing? He goes, yeah, man, we were there for three days. It's like, what? <laughs> you know, his eyes turned into saucers. And, and so, no, I mean, look, uh, any exposure, I shouldn't say any exposure is good exposure because every once in a while, if it's a scandal, it can damage you, obviously. Um, but anything that's even remotely constructive um, is good exposure. And so uh, I've done, you know, all sorts of different little interviews and little projects here and there. And some stuff have gone by the wayside and some some have worked. But what I've learned is, like, look, just say yes to as many things as you can and just keep your focus and don't. I, the, the popularity, that whole thing, that doesn't get to me because... I don't think of it like that. Uh, it, I don't get starstruck and I don't, I don't, especially in myself, you know, my ego. No, I did not want to do this <laughs> in the slightest. I didn't want to be uh, at the front of this thing. I didn't want to be the spokesperson for this. Uh, and in fact, I try to defer as many as I can. I have tried. Oh my God. Like the National Geographic piece. I tried so desperately. It's like, I don't even want to go to LA. Just pick other, other people. And they begged me. It's like, look, we'll fly you down. You'll stay with us at the hotel. It'll be wonderful. It'll be great. It's like, all right. I mean, it was like I was being dragged into things. So everything for a reason. And wherever it's going to lead, I'm just going to stay as humble as possible. I don't care, um, you know, like I did. I've done everything from major networks uh, all the way down to junior high newspapers. Literally. Junior high student newspapers. Uh, I don't, I don't care. You know, if, if they call me, the, the point is, is I don't call them. It's like, if somebody calls me and wants me to do something, it's like, yeah, if I have the time, I will absolutely do it. Um, because I'm, I feel so strongly about getting the word out and whoever calls me for whatever reason, it's, it's fate. And again, why I'm, yeah. why I'm talking to you now. Yeah. Uh, I picked this up from somebody. Is it true that you did some sort of a talk show, some sort of an interview within like a two hours notice. <clears throat> like a major talk show? Uh, I, I think it might have been something minor, but you were just alerted of it. And oh, yeah, yeah, two yeah, hours. yeah. I did, um, well, I just did the University of Arkansas. Um, did that with, yeah, barely two hours notice. Yes. In fact, I just, I just did that um, five days ago. So what happened was the University of Arkansas decided they were going to show behind the curve in their their main studio and theater. And I and I wrote them a quick thing. I said, "Hey, thanks for doing this. Really, really cool. 
and the media they wrote back and said oh man the movie's gonna start here like really shortly can we can we have you come in and skype you know skype in and and do it and i said yes uh and and we did it and i just posted it um other things like yeah i don't i don't care if it's short notice then and i can squeeze it in then i i think it was meant to be like like the the commercial i did down in melbourne australia um they gave me 10 days notice they said mm -hmm. uh hey would you like to uh shoot a, a tv commercial down in in australia and it's winter down there it's not like i was going to be hitting the beaches and, they, and I said, sure, why not? And they go, okay, we're sending plane tickets. Uh, you know, we need you down here. And it's like, you have to have a passport ready in the whole nine yards. And I did. Um, and w I think I I think I worked a total of nine hours and then spent the rest of the time, you know, camping out in the apartment they rented for me and all this other stuff. But yeah, short notice, I, I don't mind. Again, if I have the time, I did, um, some stuff doesn't even air. Uh, in 2016, I think, early 2016, I did a, 40 minute cnn interview from a parking lot of a walmart where you know i was just on the phone with them and uh it ne nothing ever happened it was just too soon so i mean other things you know i i did like with i think a five hour window i did um you know who russell brand is um no let me see let me google british that. british comedian you'd recognize him been in a lot of movies he, he was um married to katie perry for a year I'm also a bit of a boomer, but yes, I do recognize him. All right, yeah. Uh, yeah, he, he, um, his his team called me up like last minute, and because it was in Britain, like lunchtime, it was three a.m. here. And I was like, yeah, I'll do it. Sure, why not? Again, yeah. if if it's if it feels like it was meant to be, and and I got the time, uh, I will yeah. I will absolutely do it. I'm just kind of looking through some of my stuff. I've done I've done so many. I just lost count. I stopped counting basically after like 300. Yeah, that's uh, that's really crazy how you're able to do that on such a short notice. Me myself, I I uh, emailed you about two days ago. Yeah. And within two days, once you said yes, I then had to make a completely different lineup. I'm like, <laughs> all right, now I got to get some co-hosts who can talk about conspiracy theories. And I spent like two days, you know, around the clock trying to get that going on. And then the day comes. And look, it's just me and you, Coral Farmer is at work, and Honk Buster is somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, I, again, I, I'm a big believer of sooner rather than later. You know, it's like, look, what, what's your earliest slot? I mean, because you never know what tomorrow's going to bring. So, you know, putting stuff that far out in advance, you know, it doesn't make any sense to me. It's like, look, look what, when can we yeah. do it? Let's just get it done yeah. now. If I've got the time, why, why the hell not? I mean, this is what I do uh, all the time, yeah. all, all the day, you know, it's, I, I'm either scanning headlines or I'm making flattered videos or I'm promoting flattered stuff for other people or just getting the word out. Um, and, and like for a perfect example would be like um, when when Mad Mike um, died in that crash, uh, you know, Rolling Stone contacted me fairly quickly. And it's like I try to tell people, it's like, look, you can't just put it off. I know that some people it's a different era now where people like they wait. It's like, oh, I'll wait three or four days before they get back to an email. It's like, no, man. Because the, the, there's some windows that just close down. And so if I'm near a, a place where I can send an email, I will shoot it off immediately. Just be like, okay, you know, at least, at least it's in their head and they have the time to kind of work it out. It, it helps them as well. So anything else um, I can do for you? No, I think I've taken up about um, two hours of your time. Has it I think been it's two been hours? a really good podcast. Yeah, it has been. Yeah. Time's just been flying. Um, it was really fun. I do want to see, would you be interested in perhaps uh, coming on for another event? Maybe it won't be a podcast, but some sort of thing sure. in the future. Sure. I know there's this guy called Steve Anderson. I don't know if you've heard of him. He sounds, he sounds this, uh, familiar. He sounds really familiar. What do you do? He's a, he's a pretty notable preacher. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, wait. And he's he the guy like, that just hates us? Yeah, he hates flat earth. Oh, yeah, yeah. I know who Steve Anderson is. Yeah, I was thinking maybe if I could get into contact with him, right? Oh, he'll never, he'll never talk to me. He would, he would freaking that... lose his mind. Plus, he, he's, he's doing it from a biblical standpoint, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'd do it. No, no question. But he'd probably be better off with, um, I mean, I could say, here, here's me deferring. He'd probably be better off going after um, one of our um, hardcore Christian guys 
which would be like Rob yeah. Rob Skiba. Rob Skiba's excellent in that regards, and I think he'd be great. But if you if you set it up, if he wants to talk to me, that's fine. But he should probably choose if he wants to talk to anybody, because I think he'd want to talk to somebody who would do um, more biblical stuff. I mean, I could hold my own in a biblical thing, but yeah. but I'm not nearly as good as ch in chapter and verse, not even close compared to a lot of other people. Oh, yeah, that's not anything set in stone. I mean, of course, I would have to contact him first. And then after he sees that I had you on the podcast, he might turn around to me and say, you're satanic. No, <laughs> again, if he's listening or if somebody shows in this clip or whatever, um, I, I've got again, yeah, I've got nothing against Steve Anderson. I completely understand. You know, there's there are a lot of pastors out there that are worried about the congregation turning on them if they decide yeah. to go down this road. They're scared of it. They're absolutely worried. Now, I know that some of them, like, they've got so much conviction in their interpretation of the Bible. That's fine. Uh, but for, for them, look, it's only one verse. There's one verse that you, that every pastor is hanging their hat on, which is um, Isaiah 40, 22, which is he who sits on the circle of the earth. Circle is not ball. It is not globe. It is not sphere. It's circle. And they use it literally, they use Isaiah 40, 22, like it has veto power over everything. Literally everything yeah. else in the Bible, it's like that's not how it works. <laughs> you can't yeah. you can't just use that one verse and and hope that it's gonna save you. It's it's not. But if um yeah, if he's interested, by all means, I, I'd be happy to talk to him. Uh, I will be as civil as possible. I don't know if he can keep his temper, but if he if he does, that's fine. But th I don't think that's him necessarily. I think he likes pounding on the pulpit and and getting people worked up. I am not I'm not gonna fall for it. But if he wants to, that's fine. Yeah. Beyond that, I mean um. Any other future podcast, uh, oh, yeah. if you would be interested to come on, I would definitely hit you up. Um, yeah, just let me know. There's, there's a couple buddies that I would actually like to get talking to you because they're far more into conspiracy theories than I am. Like I said, Coral Farmer, uh, Honk Buster. I have a bunch of buddies that would just love to talk about this kind of stuff as well. Oh, yeah. Well, I hope I hope that um, those guys, I'm sorry they missed it, but I hope they enjoyed yeah. uh, what you and I did. And uh, if they want to delve into anything further, happy to happy to help. Yeah. Um, all right. I'll uh, I'll see you later. This has been the Not Political Podcast with Mark Sargent. Y'all can go ahead and check him out on uh, YouTube. You do make YouTube videos, and I believe you're on BitChute as well, right? Uh, it's on BitChute. I don't control that one, but yeah, it's on BitChute as well. Um, my channel on YouTube is called um, Mark Sargent. You can just type in Flat Earth Mark. You'll find it. And I'm trying to do this more often than not, and that is if you're into apps... Try to check out the Flat Earth Sun and Moon Zodiac Clock app done by a friend of mine. I don't make a freaking dime off of it, but it's really, really cool. So that's that's what I'm trying to endorse nowadays. All right. Yeah, this has been really fun. I'll see you. Uh, I'll see you another time. Okay, man. Have a good one. All right. You Bye. too.